Hi, I'm Sari Gilman, and I'm a therapist that writes and teaches on the subject of boundaries. And my guest today on Global Conversations about Boundaries is Amy Miracle. Welcome, Amy. Thanks so much for having me, Sari. And you're also a therapist. Correct. I am. No, yep, no longer practicing therapy, but I am a therapist. Yeah, and now you teach mindful art. I do. Yeah. So can you tell everyone what is mindful art? Yeah. So, I mean, I really work from the idea, right? We can do anything mindfully. You and I can have this conversation mindfully. I can be noticing like, so as I say that, I notice the way that I can feel my voice vibrating in my throat. I can feel the table under my hand. I can hear the sound of my own voice. I can hear your papers rustling. I can notice the texture of your hair, right? So it's just like tuning in through the senses. So oh, I love that description. I always right. try to use the word, it's like having awareness and but I love the way you just said, it's just tuning in through the senses. Yeah, and you can be aware of your thoughts too, right? You can also do that um, type of mindfulness meditation where you just say like, oh, wow, I notice I'm thinking about X and now I notice I'm thinking about Y and now I'm noticing that I'm feeling this sensation or whatever. But um, because a lot of the work and training that I did as a therapist was in, um, uh, well, I don't want to get into a ton of details, but basically it was in a lot of approaches that help you work with people who have trauma using the body. Mm -hmm. That work connected very directly for me with all the training I had done in art and expressive therapy. And so for me, it was a very natural uh, segue um, when I was doing um, sensory motor psychotherapy training and understanding how to help people use the body to regulate themselves through trauma. Well, everybody benefits from that, right? And especially right now where right. we're so right. anxious, um, having grounding tools that are fun <laughs> is what I'm all about. Um, and so, yeah, so let, let me pause and, and help our listeners kind of catch up to yeah. where we just got to. So um, what, what you're describing, Amy, is that um, there's a way that we can become more grounded mm -hmm. where we are. And that when you're using mindful art, it's a practice where you can use art to become aware through your senses. Correct. And, and to just get grounded through your senses. And so it's really not about being an artist per se, or seeing yourself as an artist. You don't have to see yourself that way to do mindful art. So I would say yes and no. <laughs> what you said uh, yeah, let's true tell me that. <laughs> so, I mean, I really am about, I, I believe everyone is an artist. I think we are all creative beings. Um, you do not need to have the intention to make art in order to benefit from using art in a mindful way. So in that regard, I completely agree with what you just said. Um, but my hope is that people who are attracted to the work that I'm doing also can begin to see like, because most of the people who come to me want to make art, want to be an artist, but oh. you know, the inner critic is in the way and all the things that we've been told. That's, that's interesting that people come to you wanting to make art because I came to check out just the, the practice of doing art mindfully and something mm. just kind of calming and soothing. And I wasn't at all really looking for the art. So I hear what you're saying that you're at, that, that it really is both for you. So how do you have boundaries around that inner critic? The ways that I set boundaries is one, continually bring it back to the senses. Two, my inner critic can be in the room, but she's got to, I'm going to invite her to have a cup of tea and maybe like a watch a movie or something <laughs> and let me have some space so that I can create. Because a lot of people approach the inner critic in this very, um, they try to sort of like get angry at it and push it away and tell it, like curse at it and tell it to, you know, take a hike in much meaner terms. And I personally don't think that works. I think that's a part of us that gets really worried that 
we're going to judge ourselves. Someone else is going to judge us that we're not good enough, that we're wasting our time and all those things that come up in our head. It's just, there's a part of us who's just trying to protect us. And so you can't yell it away. You have to give it some understanding and say, thanks for trying to protect me, but it's okay. I'm going to play over here. You go relax over there. And I'll call you over if I need something. <laughs> like when I'm writing, I do that with my yeah. critic. I say, not on this draft, mm -hmm. not on the next draft either. Yeah. But on my fourth time through the chapter, I'd love uh -huh. for you to give me some thoughts. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I'd like to hear your ideas. But let me, let me get through these things first. And yeah. sometimes I do invite the inner critic, but I, but I give it a role and a job. Yeah. And yeah, a yeah. time to come back. It sounds like our definition of inner critic is just like slightly different or maybe pieces of it are slightly different. And I was curious, you know, to hear more about that. About my inner critic? Yeah, because um, it, it sounds so, like you use it effectively. Yeah, so my inner critic tends to have expectations of how things look at the end of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, she's trying to make things better. Only mm -hmm. she, can, she can be working at making something better over and over and over and over again. It can be kind of exhausting. It's, what I've learned about my inner critic is it's never really good enough. Yeah. So she doesn't know when to say, that's good enough good, mm -hmm. we're done, or we're finished. Yeah. So I actually see myself as a friend to my inner critic. Like she does have some ability and talent, I think. And her mm -hmm. talent is that she is trying to make something better. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm writing, I do need to make something better. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I've written um, three books and I'm in my fourth one. So there's, you know, an editing process because I have to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Um, but I don't want to hear her feedback early in when, yeah. I'm, when I'm doing something because I'm not really aiming for such a high level of expectation at that Point. And so what right. I've managed to figure out with my inner critic is to work with her on when I want the expectation to go up, I invite her in and mm -hmm. say, let's, I need to make this better. What do you think? Give mm -hmm. me some input here. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited to hear from her at that point. And it doesn't hurt me or feel stifling. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking w at what point in my creative process. And if she comes in too early when I'm just brainstorming and throwing ideas out and just getting words on the page and maybe um, I don't want to judge it because mm -hmm. I want to keep going. So how is that different for your relationship with an inner critic? Well, first of all, I, I, it's great to hear people who other people who think about it a lot, but think about it a little bit, like pack it up a little bit differently. You know, like I, I like how you conceptualize, uh, I don't know, the way I hear it is sort of this idea of like your inner critic helping you to reach excellence without it being kind of trying to perform to the degree that then you ruin it because <laughs> you're trying to be perfectionistic. Right. Because I can sometimes, and that can happen if I'm too tired. So mm -hmm. if I just let the critic go wild, she can exhaust me. Sure. And it never feels good enough because she doesn't really know when that is. <laughs> I have to. Well, well speaking of in. boundaries, right? She doesn't. She doesn't have the boundary. She just keeps doesn't. pushing until then. There's nothing left, and then she says, "See, it sucks." <laughs> exactly, pushing until there's nothing left, and so I have to bring some of that to her and say, "I'm too tired right now to work on it or make it mm -hmm. better." Um, or I don't want your ideas when I'm sleeping. I need right. to go to sleep now. Right. Stop telling me all the things you want me to do differently. Like right. hold it for tomorrow. Um, so so that's an interesting way to to think about, uh, like to to blow out the critic a little bit. Yeah, and to just work with that. And I'm sure people listening to us have an inner critic of their own, and to look at ways you can make that. Uh, make use of that part of yourself without feeling like that part of yourself is damaging or harmful. Mm -hmm. you put some boundaries around how to use that part of you. Right. So it's interesting because I think, um, yeah, you have a, a way of 
having a real like a, a collaborative relationship it sounds like with your inner critic but like with boundaries around it mm -hmm. um whereas i think i tend to split off i think i tend to split off the part of me <laughs> that um gets yeah like over performing or perfectionistic or just like Debbie, you know, doubting and, and, and downing and whatever, and negative, I tend to split that whole section of me off when I think about the inner critic, like the whole part that feels not helpful, I tend to just separate out. And that's what I label for myself as my inner critic, just like a very, mm -hmm. just the very not helpful parts of me. But then of course I have, um, parts of me that, you know, there's a continuum there, right? Like there are parts of me that obviously strive for excellence and want things to be a certain way or, you know, hopes that the painting is going to come out well and is, you know, analyzing and looking. And yeah. then, you know, there's this dance in creating. Yes, so I call that part also the inner critic. I, right. I, I right. allow her to have some right. good parts. Right. <laughs> yeah. But see, what this brings up for me is how important it is to give yourself permission to individualize, right? So like, if someone listening is thinking like, oh, I like something that Sari says, and I like something from what Amy says, that's great. You don't need to conform to what either of us said, but rather right. find the thing that feels true in yourself. Yes. Yeah. And that works for you particularly. Yes. So I noticed that you were also teaching some free classes on Facebook. Is that something you do regularly, Amy? Yeah, during, well, so on a period, usually about once a month I do that, but during uh, the pandemic, I've been doing it every single week on Friday, usually Fridays, but I've been doing every single week. The other thing that I noticed, and, and maybe it's different for some of your other kinds of intensives or workshops, but I did notice that you were using kind of one thing, like I didn't have to have 15 different art supplies. Mm -hmm. You're nodding, like, is that intentional? That, Very. Oh, Especially with these workshops. About, can you talk about that, about why that is? There's freedom mm -hmm. in being able to narrow down what you're doing. Mm. I love that thought. There's freedom in narrowing down what you're doing. Everyone can just take that from this conversation. I would love to hear more about how you got into the whole boundaries thing too. Um, so for 20 years, I ran nonprofits uh -huh. and I've been a therapist for 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked with homeless kids and really another big part of my work is on trauma and secondary mm -hmm. trauma and I became very traumatized by mm -hmm. working with abused kids yes. and I had to heal okay and then I turned around I looked back at our field in human services yeah and healthcare, and I said uh-oh yeah. <laughs> what's happening for all of you out here yeah. um so I started writing and teaching about boundaries and um I don't know. I got calls, to, you know, I, I was asked to talk in a little theater to like 200 people, nine minutes about the heart of my work. And I spoke about my own journey with working on my own boundaries and like people in the theater were crying. My phone didn't stop ringing for a year and a half. So I said, Oh, I'll write a book to, so that they can use on that. And I'll create a workshop. People can come in groups. And the next thing I know, I was kind of traveling all over teaching this thing. And um, then I followed up with a book on overwhelm recovery for healthcare mm -hmm. and human service people. Mm -hmm. And I really focus on people in healthcare and people yeah. in human services, but general public comes anyway. Yeah. And then what I learned is, you know, every time I was teaching in a, in a room, I said, how many of you have a journal practice? And like, no hands went up. And this really baffled me because journaling is so helpful for stress yeah. relief. So I just did a book on journaling for people that hate journaling. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. And it is it. And I collaborated with an artist, a 
graphic designer for it. And um, it has collage prompts and writing prompts, but it's all on boundaries and on self-care. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting because, um, not surprising, but like, so I said that I was an activist first, right? So I did human rights work around US policy towards Guatemala and I was meeting all these uh, massacres, survivors, and like totally inspired by them, but then also feeling very helpless about the work that I was doing, like not feeling as effective as I wanted to and starting to feel really overwhelmed and wanting to just help like one person at a time. And then also doing so much of my own art and realizing how amazing it was. Anyway, went back to grad school and then in my first year internship worked at a, um, it was a, like a dual treatment center and women's shelter for women with trauma and um, domestic abuse issues and got totally like, you know, got hit hard with secondary trauma there, which was great because early on I learned how to set all these boundaries and how to, you know, use the skills that I was learning to help myself and to whatever bound it was hugely on boundaries obviously um and then uh i had another point but anyway just the idea being that like it it comes from the same place i've always been on about boundaries and when i was still doing mental health and agencies i was constantly you know my in-service trainings were always around us <laughs> and um you know and i just feel like it just makes so much sense. So I'm super glad that you're doing all this work. I, I, I think that that shared experience that we have is really important. You know, I think when you deeply have experienced trauma and secondary trauma and you really know what it is and what the recovery experience is and you take things seriously and then you're wanting to put out only things that are really helpful um, I think maybe that's what I really responded to in your work, you know, we're right on the edge of a lot of secondary trauma right now. And um, some, most people are kind of in it right now too. And yeah, um, I wrote an article for the medium on being vulnerable to secondary trauma and just looking at myself right now and mm. how vulnerable I feel to it again for the first time in my 26 years. Um, and I think that's what I was gravitating towards with your work was I was seeing some just honoring of coming back into my senses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, found that really helpful right now. So, yeah. This, well, thank you for this great conversation, Amy. Thank you so much, Sari. It was really fun. Yeah. And, um, and I am, I'm going to be taking more classes from you. I just love your work. So oh, thank good. you for what you're sharing. And I hope other people discover how fabulous and helpful this work is to kind of soothe and calm the soul. Oh, thank you. And I'm so glad that there's somebody else out there talking about boundaries because I think boundaries are like the biggest blessing on the planet. <laughs> boundaries are so important. So um, I think it's really important work that you do. Thank you. Well, you have a great day. All right, you too.